Good morning, folks. Welcome to the Getting Started with Amazon Redshift session. Uh, I know it's a little early. I hope you had some coffee and are not going to doze off on me. Um, we're going to, uh, before I get started, so my name is Pavan Potakuchi. I am a principal product manager with um, Amazon Redshift. I've been with AWS for uh, about five years, uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time on RDS, uh, a little bit of time on Elasticash, uh, so all within our database services portfolio. So uh, today is an introductory session. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce what Amazon Redshift is. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of uh, the service, uh, how some of the customers are using it, um, and then a few tips to get started. So here is a brief uh, overview of uh, the AWS big data portfolio. So we have services like Direct Connect, AWS Import Export, and Snowball that enables you to move large amounts of data. And you can persist that data across a variety of AWS services from S3 to Amazon DynamoDB. And you can run um, analytics on uh, this data using Amazon EMR, Amazon Redshift, and uh, a few other services we have uh, within the big data portfolio. So um, Amazon Redshift, which is the topic of the day, uh, so it's a fast, simple, and cost-effective uh, petabyte-scale data warehouse as a service. Amazon EMR is an easy-to-use analytics platform built around the powerful Hadoop ecosystem. And um, Amazon Machine Learning um, is a service that has been internally used within Amazon.com for um, serving use cases such as a recommendation engine, and then has been externalized uh, a year or so ago. Amazon QuickSight is a cloud-powered business intelligence service uh, that enables end users to build visualizations, create storyboards, and uh, share um, their insights with uh, different other users within the organization. So um, you have all the tools to collect big data, to process it, to analyze it, to share it uh, with, uh, uh, across your organization using a few clicks on uh, AWS. So what is Amazon Redshift? Um, so like I described earlier, uh, Amazon Redshift is aimed at making data warehousing faster, simpler, and uh, cost-effective. So uh, to begin with, Redshift is a relational data warehouse. So we have a Postgres-based uh, front-end, uh, so which gives you the full-blown SQL compatibility. And we have a MPP, or Massively Parallel Processing Backend that enables you to scale from anywhere between a few gigs to hundreds of terabytes to even multiple petabytes. It's uh, significantly faster um, than um, row-based stores, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is the case. It's also significantly faster, an order of magnitude um, faster than uh, SQL on Hadoop. It's uh, an order of magnitude cheaper than other uh, massively parallel processing database engines out there in the market. So it's a managed service, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. At a high level, all the database operations that you care about, backups, um, restoration, patching, um, HA, disaster recovery, all of these things are made um, extremely simple with the service. It starts at less than $1,000 per terabyte per year, um, and uh, you can get started with, under, uh, with uh, 25 cents per hour. So traditionally, um, data warehousing vendors have focused on the left, leftmost part of the slide, which is the enterprise segment. And uh, deals involve multiple uh, negotiations, multi-year deployments, multi-million dollars. Um, so this, uh, the enterprise uh, customer segment certainly um, has been adopting Redshift pretty widely. And uh, for some of the reasons that we described earlier, um, it's uh, significantly more cost effective than legacy pl platforms. It's extremely easy to use. And uh, it uh, enables uh, higher DBA productivity. That said, there are a lot of small companies um, and uh, medium-sized companies that in today's world generate a lot of data. So you Think about the social, mobile, 
um, and the IoT companies that uh, also are generating a lot and a lot of data. And um, the option to analyze this data has historically been around, uh, you know, either they have to make do with a row-based store that can't scale and can't perform um, as much as they want, or um, use uh, Hadoop-based platforms, which are also a bit slower and uh, harder to use, especially for end users. Um, so Redshift um, makes that uh, value proposition around performance uh, significantly better. It also, uh, given the SQL compatibility and uh, the Postgres front end, it means end users don't have to learn programming, scripting, figuring out how to move data across um, different uh, data silos. And again, given the compatibility aspects, it works easily with any of the BI tools um, that you use today. Uh, it also works well with Hadoop, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, and some of the other services such as machine learning and uh, real-time streaming of data. So in addition to this particular segment, uh, we are also seeing um, significant adoption of Redshift, Redshift within um, the SaaS community. And uh, one of the important reasons there is uh, SaaS companies not only want to provide applications to uh, their customers, they also want to provide uh, intelligence from the data that they're gathering to end users as well. Um, and given the model of pay as you grow um, and uh, grow as you need, that model aligns quite well with uh, how uh, their business works and how AWS works as well. And of course, so that is part of the appeal as well. Um, so this is a quick snapshot of the Forrester Wave, which was released uh, late last year. And as you can see here, uh, I don't know how to use a pointer, but um, so uh, Redshift has been um, noted as one of the leaders within the enterprise data warehouse um, Forrester Wave. And uh, Redshift uh, is just about three years old right now. Um, and given um, th its placement alongside companies that have had data warehousing technologies for uh, decades, um, so I think we've come a long way within a short three years time span. And primarily um, because of the customer momentum, because of the um, feature set and uh, the fast-paced uh, uh, feature delivery as well. A uh, quick snapshot of some of the customers that have been um, using Amazon Redshift. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, NASDAQ uh, shortly. So let's talk a little bit about Amazon Redshift's architecture. So how does the MPP system work? So Redshift has a leader node, which acts as a simple SQL endpoint. So um, when you're executing queries through your BI tool or a SQL client, um, the leader node is the one that um, accepts your queries. Uh, it stores the metadata associated with your data model, uh, the tables, views, and objects that you create. Um, so the, that metadata is part of the leader node. It optimizes the query plan, and it generates a byte code um, the, after parsing the query, and uh, pushes that code into the compute node so that each compute node can execute um, the queries in parallel. So the compute node themselves, um, they, are, uh, they have the local um, column, uh, they store the data locally in the columnar format. Um, and uh, all the operations that you care about, um, including uh, query execution, data loading, backups, restoration, uh, resizes, all of these operations happen parallelly across the compute nodes, which means as you add more nodes, your performance of these operations scales linearly. Um, so pricing, as we described earlier, starts at 25 cents per hour. Uh, you can start with 160 gigs and grow up to uh, two petabytes of compressed data. Uh, so we have two different platforms, um, an SSD-based platform and an HDD-based platform. And uh, so the SSD-based uh, platform is five times more expensive per uh, gigabyte, but it also performs 10 to 15 times uh, better than the HDD platform. So depending on your price to performance requirements, um, you can pick one uh, or the other. And so there are customers that, that use both as well. Um, they life cycle the older data into HDD-based clusters. They keep the hard data in the SSD-based clusters um, for um, faster performance. Um, so 
We talked a little bit about um, how Amazon Redshift uh, performs uh, significantly better than some of the other alternatives. And so why is that the case? So uh, columnar stores, as some of you may be familiar, um, like Redshift, they consume dramatically less I.O. compared to those stores. And the reason for that is, imagine a table with 100 columns. And if you're querying five columns out of that, <coughs> which is 5% of the data, when you're using a row store, it gets all that data and discards 95% of it that you don't want. Uh, but it still performs at I.O. Uh, columnar stores such as Redshift only gets um, accesses um, the columns that you're specifying in a query. Um, columnar format also lends to high level of data compression. Uh, so imagine having um, a column like gender where you just have two values. Um, and uh, so that compresses significantly. And compression not only lends itself to uh, savings of space, it also lends for better performance because uh, Redshift performs queries on compressed data, and uh, the more compressed the data, the less I.O. that is needed. Uh, Redshift also uses what we call as zone maps, um, and uh, we'll talk about zone maps and how sort keys work. At a high level, zone maps store, um, are, can be thought of as indexes um, that are stored in memory, um, so that when you execute a query, only the bare uh, minimum amount of, uh, um, bare min minimum number of blocks are fetched. Uh, from uh, the data storage. Uh, with uh, direct attached storage and large data block sizes, so we use one megabyte block sizes within Redshift, um, so all of these lend themselves for um, higher uh, query throughput and performance. Uh, we talked a bit about how uh, all of these operations are managed at the compute node level, hence uh, parallelized and uh, scale linearly. <clears throat> so that also um, gets you better performance. And um, from a hardware perspective, we work with um, EC2, we work with an infrastructure team to ensure that the platforms that we support are um, optimized for high I.O. intensive workloads. Uh, so we are able to do four gigabytes of uh, scans per second per node within Redshift, and uh, this number is on only gonna go up as we add more, um, as we refresh the hardware. Uh, with enhanced networking, we are able to process over a million packets per node per second. And um, we also have a regular cadence of um, auto-patch improvements uh, for which you don't have to do anything. They get patched and improve the performance of the system. Um, so a couple of examples, recent examples about the performance improvements that we have done. Um, so the, the second generation HDD instance type it provides uh, twice as much memory, twice as much of compute capacity, 1.5 times uh, disk throughput as the older generation uh, HDD-based instance type. And it's priced at the exact same uh, price. So you're not paying anything extra for all of the uh, additional um, computational resources you're getting out of this new generation instance type. Um, it provides a performance improvement of over 50% um, on average. Um, in addition, we have released, uh, um, we've improved the I.O. and commit performance um, and uh, rolled out a few improvements associated with that uh, earlier this year. And uh, what this does is it reduces the amount of time that is needed to commit data, which means it improves the write throughput. Um, and indirectly, it improves the read throughput as well. Um, and um, so this uh, demonstrate, this is an actual customer workload that demonstrated a 35% improvement in TPCDS that also, that demonstrated similar improvement as well. So at a high level, um, the idea is within the last few months, the performance of the system improved by about 2x, um, you know, without uh, customers having to do anything to uh, realize the benefits. Um, Redshift, as we described, discussed, um, is priced at, uh, starts at $1,000 per terabyte per year. Uh, so that is for a three-year reservation um, and uh, the HDD platform. Uh, so here is a range of prices as you uh, look at DC1, as you look at the different pricing models. Pricing is pretty straightforward. It's just the number of nodes that you're using times the price per hour for that particular node. There are no extra charges for the leader node. Um, the charges here are for compressed um, gigabyte or terabyte. 
So we uh, described, uh, discussed about uh, Redshift being a managed service. So what does a managed service mean? Um, so at a high level, uh, provisioning is extremely straightforward. So with a few clicks, you can get started with a cluster um, that ranges from a few gigs to a few terabytes to uh, multiple petabytes. You can, um, the backups associated with these, uh, as, as you load data, it gets continuously backed up and incrementally backed up um, into S3. There are multiple copies of uh, data within the cluster. So as you write data into a particular node, it's all synchronously um, <clears throat> replicated into a different node within the cluster, uh, which means if there is a node failure, we are able to uh, replace that node um, automatically and hydrate it behind the scenes. Data is also incrementally backed up into S3. Um, so what that, what, what that means is um, if you have a terabyte size cluster and if you only updated 10 gigs since the last backup, only that 10 gigs um, gets um, backed up into S3. So we develop a lineage as you back up um, additional data. And uh, you can also keep backups in sync across regions. Um, so for disaster recovery, so you can say backup, my backups in uh, US East region needs to be um, synced up with backups in the US West region, and it gets done automatically behind the scenes. And one of the interesting features um, that is uh, pretty understated is what we call a streaming restore. So irrespective of the size of the database or the backup, so whether you have a terabyte or 10 terabytes, restoring from that backup takes just a few minutes. So what we do is we provision a cluster, we load the metadata and open up access for the cluster to you while lazily loading the backup from, um, the, from S3 into uh, local storage. So you can perform reads, you can perform writes while the blocks stream into um, the cluster. And of course the performance is gonna be a bit degraded until the nodes are completely hydrated but what uh, this sort of, uh, what Streaming Restore enables is um, dealing with uh, failures um, in a significantly faster manner. So when you have local failures within uh, a cluster, so whether multiple disks failed, uh, fails within a node or uh, a node fails within a cluster, uh, we automatically monitor that and provision a replacement. <clears throat> And given that we have data mirrored in other nodes within the cluster, um, we hydrate the uh, newly provisioned node with data from the mirror. Um, so all of these is taken care of automatically um, if the failure is local to a particular availability zone. Failures that are at an availability zone level are extremely rare, but they do happen. And when that happens, given you have your latest backups um, stored in S3, um, you can uh, restore from it very quickly with the streaming restore functionality. And um, even if a regional level disaster happens, which again is even uh, more rare, um, you can keep back, given that you can keep backups across regions in sync, you can restore your cluster very quickly in a different region uh, for business continuity purposes. Um, security is something that is built in across every component of Redshift. <clears throat> you can load data in an encrypted manner uh, from S3. You can use client-side encryption, you can use server-side encryption uh, to encrypt data within S3 and load encrypted data from S3 into Redshift. And once the data comes into Redshift, you can encrypt it at rest. All the blocks um, on the various different disks uh, get their own encryption keys, and all the block level encryption keys are encrypted with the cluster level key, which is in turn encrypted uh, with the master key. So we use envelope, hierarchical envelope based encryption. Um, while connecting to the database, you can use SS SSL, um, so um, encryption in transit. Uh, you can use ECDHC ciphers uh, for perfect forward security. And uh, from a network, networking perspective, Amazon VPC provides you with uh, um, network isolation. Um, and uh, we use a slightly different model uh, for VPC. Um, so when you create a Redshift cluster and deploy it within your own VPC, um, the leader node becomes part of your VPC. 
The compute nodes um, themselves are part of an Amazon internal VPC, which nobody else has access to, including yourself. Um, so you can access the data within the compute nodes through the leader node, but you don't have direct access to uh, the database files uh, for, for uh, uh, security purposes. Uh, you can audit um, logins. You can audit user activity. Um, so all of this can be um, dumped into an S3 bucket that you own, and you can analy analyze it at a later point. Uh, we have AWS CloudTrail integration, which enables you to, you to track all the API calls that have been made um, on, a, uh, on your particular cluster for compliance purposes. Um, so there are multiple compliance initiatives that uh, we have uh, been through, SOC 1, 2, 3, uh, the PCI DSS, FedRAMP, which is a federal government uh, compliance standard, and HIPAA uh, slash BA, uh, which is for healthcare. Um, so unlike on-premises uh, software, uh, we innovate pretty quickly. Um, so typically, you pay a premium for getting maintenance updates uh, for on-premises software. You also um, get patches or you know, new feature enhancements probably once every six months or a year. Um, so with Redshift, we, um, we have a continuous deployment model. Um, so we release uh, improvements and features almost at a two-week cadence, and all these uh, improvements are directly patched into your cluster without you having to worry, uh, worry about it. Um, so there are various data science-related um, functionality available to you. Um, so approximate functions is an example. Uh, so it enables you to um, get um, not necessarily precise, but closely accurate data within 2% error range for uh, queries including select, um, you know, count distinct, and such. And uh, so you get results very fast, but they're within a 2% error range. And there are lots of use cases where statistically significant data uh, is good enough, and uh, getting it faster is important. Um, so we have user-defined functions, uh, which uh, enable you to write your own Python functions that can be embedded in SQL. You can also use thousands of functions that are available to, uh, through uh, uh, native Python libraries as well. Um, so the machine learning service, we talked a little bit about it. And uh, you can also use R SAS um, in conjunction with Redshift pretty easily. And we work with these vendors pretty closely. Uh, for example, uh, with SAS, if you're writing a query on SAS, um, instead of just fetching the raw data and processing it on SAS, um, what SAS does is um, it maps functions from SAS into Redshift and processes the queries natively on Redshift so that you can take advantage of the MPP functionality. And then the results are returned to you uh, through SAS, and it's all transparent. We have a fairly uh, large and growing ecosystem of partners. Uh, we respect the investments that you made in your data integration side, in your business intelligence side. Um, so uh, partners including uh, Informatica, Tableau, MicroStrategy. Um, so we work with all of these uh, partners very closely um, and ensure that our uh, solutions mutually are certified and uh, you have uh, supportability. Uh, we have also have a range of system integrators that can help you with uh, migration um, and uh, uh, implementation. Um, so it, it, at AWS in general, we believe in the philosophy of uh, um, service-oriented architecture. So we don't sell monolithic solutions um, that uh, you may or may not use. Um, you can pick and choose between multiple services, um, and uh, a, a lot of them work uh, with uh, Redshift for various use cases. So let's talk a little bit about some of the um, use cases and how customers are leveraging Redshift. Um, so NTD Docomo, so they are Japan's largest uh, mobile uh, carrier. Uh, they have 68 million customers. They generate tens of terabytes of data per day across uh, uh, their mobile network. And uh, overall, the data set size is two petabytes compressed, around six petabytes uncompressed. Um, and um, they use this uh, data for a variety of data science applications across their marketing operations um, functions. 
And uh, they were using Greenplum on-premises um, for uh, this platform. And they encountered uh, scaling challenges given the amount of data that they were bringing in on a daily basis, uh, and also performance issues. And they wanted a platform that, has, uh, that meets their security bar, given it's the telecom information um, and uh, it's very sensitive. They wanted a very secure platform. And they also needed a hybrid environment because this particular uh, data is generated on-premises um, and they were not gonna move their on-premises transactional systems uh, into the cloud yet. Um, so they wanted a, an, an analytics environment that can interoperate with their on-premises uh, uh, data center. Um, so they migrated to Redshift about a year ago. And uh, so this is a high-level view of their architecture. Um, their data is generated on-premises. They have a direct connect line uh, with uh, one of the data centers uh, of AWS. Um, they process this data. Uh, they move that data into S3 on a regular basis and then load that into Redshift. It's a very large cluster, uh, 125 node uh, DS2 8XLs, um, 4,000 hour vCPUs and 30 terabytes of RAM. It's just huge given the amount of data that they are uh, analyzing. Um, so what they found is after the migration, um, a lot of their analytics queries um, improved um, by over 10x. Um, they are able to roll out new business intelligence applications very quickly, and uh, they have significantly less um, operational overhead. Another example is NASDAQ, and as you're pretty familiar, um, they run exchanges across um, a lot of different countries in the world. Um, and their use case is around analyzing orders, ask, bids, um, and uh, uh, trade execution, so market data across seven exchanges. Um, they generate about seven billion rows of uh, data a day. And uh, the use case is largely around um, identifying, uh, analyzing client activity, fraud detection, surveillance, billing, et cetera. And they were using a SQL Server instance on-premises uh, for uh, this use case. And uh, it was very expensive for them. They were spending over a million dollars a year. Um, and the problem that they had was around capacity. Uh, similar to Entity Docomo, they were generating a lot of data a day, and so they had to go purge the data sitting on their um, data warehousing environment before they move new data in. Um, so the, the data set that they could store in that environment was just about a year. Um, and uh, so their requirement was uh, a solution that provides some uh, lower to total cost of ownership. And similar to NTD Docomo, you can imagine the financial data, um, there is stringent uh, security requirements, regulatory uh, needs as well. Um, so this is their architecture. It's a little bit similar um, to the previous example in that it's also a hybrid environment. So they have their transactional systems um, running uh, on premises, and then they load that data periodically into S3 and then copy it into Redshift. Um, and um, they have over 300 terabytes of compressed data or about a petabyte of uncompressed. Um, and uh, 2.7 trillion rows. A lot of that involves derivations. So what NASDAQ does is uh, somewhat um, you know, ELT-like in that they load the data, they process it, they derive um, columns based on um, different uh, computational requirements and then uh, create new tables based off it. So all of that they do within Redshift. Um, and uh, they have a lot of tables with uh, um, over a billion rows and actually eight tables with 100 billion rows. Um, so overall, the migration took about seven man months. Um, so that kind of gives you a rough ballpark around um, you know, the uh, effort involved in order to migrate from a different database engine. And um, they, they're able to get this at a fraction of the cost um, of their legacy environment. They have a lot more storage. Um, they're able to uh, grow more. and. Uh, uh, similar to um, the previous example, they got better performance for uh, a variety of queries that they have migrated. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get started, a few tips and tricks. So in general, uh, the provisioning experience on Redshift is very straightforward. 
All you have to do is go to the management console, you create, uh, you specify a cluster identifier, um, and uh, um, you know, the master user, the password associated with it. So this will be your sysadmin-like user. Um, you specify the type of uh, um, nodes you want to run. Uh, you specify the number of nodes you want to run in your cluster. And so that could either be dependent on the amount of data that you're bringing in, or it could be dependent on the performance requirements. And over time, as you um, start using Redshift, you might realize you need fewer nodes, or you might need more nodes. And so um, as you realize the need for reducing the size of your cluster or increasing the size of your cluster could be dependent on the growth of data. It could be dependent on, the, on your performance requirements. Um, it's very straightforward to do a resize operation on Redshift. Um, so you can go from 10 nodes to 20 nodes or whatever is your target uh, size requirements. And so what happens with the resize process is um, your cluster remains online for read, uh, read uh, access as uh, during the resize process. We provision a new cluster with the target configuration. Uh, we copy data from your source uh, nodes to your target nodes, um, and all of that happens in parallel. And of course, there's redistribution involved because you know, you've distributed data in a certain way and you're adding more nodes, so there's redistribution involved. Um, but um, all of that happens while you are able to access your cluster um, for uh, reporting or reads. And you're only charged for the source cluster until the resize operation is complete. So data modeling. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, some of the things that are different for Redshift as you um, think about using it uh, from a different platform. So sort keys and distribution keys are um, pretty important uh, components of Redshift. And let's understand a little bit about it. So let's take a query. Um, let's say you have a log, um, a time series log data. And um, you're trying to execute a query, select count star from these logs where date equals a particular date. So if you have an unsorted table, and in this particular example, we have four blocks, and each block, like we discussed earlier, is a megabyte. And um, so each column is broken down into multiple megabyte blocks. So we are here taking a particular column. And now if this, uh, what happens is each block's min and max values get stored as zone maps in memory. So you have 1st June, 20th June, 8th, 30th, 12, 20, 2, and 25. Right, so those are min-max values for each of the blocks as far as the dates are concerned. And now you're trying to search for a particular date. And so what happens is um, you're scanning multiple blocks here. Because the data is unsorted, you have overlap across these blocks. So 9th June 2013 um, is part of the first block, the second block, and the fourth block. So you're almost doing a full scan there. If the data is sorted, and as you can see here, um, there's no overlap between um, the date ranges across these blocks. So you're gonna just query for one, one single block. And of course, this is just an example. As you scale it to millions of blocks, it makes a difference. So um, it's an order of n versus an order of one complexity um, between unsorted and uh, sorted uh, columns. And so we have three different types of sort keys um, that are available with Redshift. Single column, which is the example that we have seen earlier. And compound, which just means you have multiple columns, and interleaved, um, I'll talk about that. So single column is pretty straightforward. Um, so you have an example of um, a date, um, which is what the uh, column is sorted by, and the rest of the regions, um, the rest of the columns um, associated with this table. And now let's take the example of a compound sort, and this is similar to you know, a compound index in um, the row-based uh, environments. Um, so the data is sorted by the first column, and then within the first column, it's sorted by the second, and within the second by the third, right? And what happens is if you're trying to um, query for the first column, you get an order of one complexity. If you're trying to do second or third, it's you know, probably order of n complexity. So um, it helps if you're in compound sort model, it helps if your queries have both the first and the second, or first, second, and third, 
um, while you do the queries. Um, the third example is interleaved sorting. <clears throat> and um, so we use um, a space-filling curve-based algorithm to sort this data in an optimal way such that you get same amount of selectivity for each of those columns. What that means is, irrespective of whether you're querying by the first, second, or third column, you get similar amount of performance. And so this is because we store it internally within a format that um, um, lends to this type of performance. But this has a trade-off in that, in the previous example, if you're querying by the first column, you get an order of one complexity. Here, if you're searching for any of these columns, you get order of um, n power one by three complexity of three columns, so you're doing a cube root of n. Um, so if you have a million blocks, it means you're gonna scan very few blocks in this particular model. That said, you're not still getting an order of one complexity. So there is a bit of a trade-off in using compound versus interleaved sort keys, um, and of course, the uh, Single versus compound, there isn't a trade-off. It depends on your use case and the patterns. But at a high level, it's important to understand how single compound and interleaved sort keys work um, so that you can use it for, um, uh, as part of your data modeling exercise. The next part, so sort keys is about um, how the columns are sorted. And you can think of them at a high level. Uh, they're very different from indexes, but you can Think of them notionally as indexes uh, if you're coming from uh, row-based environments. Um, the distribution keys um, is how the data gets distributed across the various compute nodes. And um, so we have three types of distribution um, available, um, even-based distribution, key-based, and all. And so let's look at how, the, how each of these work. Uh, so let's, this is a simple table, um, ID, gender, name. And if you're doing an even distribution, it's a round robin distribution. So all we do is, you know, the first row gets um, attributed to the first node, second row is the second node, and you know, goes so on. The second one is a key-based distribution. In, so how, the key-based distribution, you know, uses a hash function. Um, so the node, uh, the records are allocated to various nodes based on um, what the hash value is. And um, so that was one example. And you know, the gender uh, uh, particular, so, so if you're distributing a gender based on a key, then it just goes to two nodes, right, because of the hashing. So the reason why key-based distribution is important um, is if you are trying to, given the MPP environment, all your records within a table gets distributed across the various nodes. So if you have a giant fact table that you're joining with the giant distribution table, it's ideal that both of them are uh, based on um, key-based distribution and you're using the same key. So that when you're joining these two tables, <coughs> the joins are co-located. So given the hash function for the same key results in the same node, if you have two different tables that you're joining by and using a key-based distribution, the joins are co-located. Otherwise, what happens is we'll have to do a broadcast across the various compute nodes, right? You're joining data that is sitting in one table in this node with uh, data sitting in um, another table in a different node. So they need to talk to each other. Um, so depending on the volume of uh, data that is involved in your query and the amount of broadcast that is required, um, you could have some performance um, uh, degradation associated with it. Um, so it's important to understand um, the distribution concept and use it appropriately for, um, you know, choose between a key-based distribution and even distribution um, as you see fit. And um, so some thumb rules around um, how, the third one is all, right? So all is just, all the data within the table is present on every node. So it's just replicated en masse across each of the compute nodes. Um, so here are a few thumb rules of thinking about um, uh, distribution. So if you have tables that require no joins, you can go do an even distribution. Um, so given there's no join implication, you're not gonna have a broadcast. 
For smaller dimension tables, less than 1,000 rows, I think it's reasonable to think about even distribution or even all works. Um, and the reason for that is uh, there isn't much of an overhead when you're broadcasting a few thousand rows across um, the compute node. So each compute node is connected with each other with a 10 gig uh, network. So if you're, when you're broadcasting a few nodes, a few rows, it doesn't really matter. Um, the key-based distribution is something that you'll want to consider for large fact tables, large dimension tables. So large fact tables and dimension tables that are joined using the same keys, um, use that as um, the distribution style. And uh, for medium dimension tables, uh, 1,000 rows to you know, multiple million rows, you can use an all uh, distribution. So usually a few million rows, the storage associated with it is not too much, right? It's a few gigs probably. Um, and um, Having it across all the nodes means if you're doing a join, you're not going to have a broadcast. All the data associated with um, your dimension tables are present in all the nodes. Um, so those are some of the um, things that I would keep in mind from a data modeling perspective as you start using Redshift. And uh, let's talk a little bit about loading data. Um, so there are multiple options to load data. Uh, a lot of that involves um, S3. So if you have flat files, um, you can load it into S3 uh, using the multi-part upload. And from S3 to Redshift, um, there's a simple copy command um, that you can execute to load the data. You can also use the variety of uh, data integration tools that we discussed earlier. Uh, if you're doing ETL, if your data is coming from transactional sources uh, that needs aggregation and rollups, that sort of stuff, you can use ETL tools, um, you know, a bunch of them, and they in turn integrate with Redshift using S3 uh, in between. Um, for streaming data, Amazon Kinesis is an option. If you're not familiar with Kinesis, um, so it's a um, service that enables you to stream um, hundreds of terabytes per hour across hundreds of uh, thousands of data producers. Uh, you can process that um, using, collect it and process it using Kinesis. There's a new service called Kinesis Firehose um, that enables you to just, you know, define um, the um, throughput that is needed for um, your streaming data and then a destination, whether it's S3 or Redshift. And as data comes in, collect, gets collected, gets loaded into Redshift automatically, and there are customers who load data every five minutes, um, granularity for uh, uh, streaming data. It's, it's not real time, but it's sort of near real time depending upon your use case. Um, so Kinesis is another way of loading data into Redshift uh, for streaming data. And um, so here is a high level tip to keep in mind as you load data from S3 into Redshift. Um, we recommend using multiple input files depending upon um, how many slices you have within uh, a node and how many nodes you have within a cluster. And slice is a compute unit, um, so you can think of it closer to a core. So each slice within Redshift can parallelly perform operations. And we talked about parallelization earlier, and it's not necessarily at a node level, it's actually even more granular. You have multiple slices within each node that can um, go and execute a job in parallel. And so that is important because um, as you, if you're loading a single file from um, S3 into uh, Redshift, what happens is only one slice is doing all the work. So if you have a you know, eight Excel cluster, you have 16 slices on it, and only one slice is gonna do all the work, which means it's gonna be relatively slow. Um, so you can typically get around 100 megabytes per second uh, within um, a particular node. So that's the bandwidth for the load that is available to you. Using a single input file means you're getting a fraction of it. So um, if you have multiple files, in this particular case, given there are 16 slices in this node, you'll want to have multiple, six, uh, you know, 16, 32 multiples of 16 as a number of files. If you have thousands of files, it doesn't really matter because you already have a multiple in there. Um, and uh, so then what happens is each of these 16 slices goes and starts picking up a file in parallel and starts loading into Redshift. And so there you get the full bandwidth available to you uh, by each node um, to uh, load the data. And so we talked about um, provisioning, we talked about um, uh, 
uh, loading data. We talked about um, some of the tips and tricks for data modeling. Let's understand a little bit about how to query data. So it's very straightforward. So we have JDBC, ODBC drivers. Um, given the Postgres syntax um, and compatibility, you can use standard drivers to connect to Redshift. You can either use standard JDBC, ODBC, Postgres drivers, or um, Redshift supplied custom drivers, which are more performance optimized. And um, if you're using um, you know, uh, the BI tools here, all of them talk to Redshift using our custom drivers um, that gives you better performance. You can also use um, you know, SQL client um, directly to talk to Redshift. Again, standard drivers or custom drivers. Um, there's also uh, sar BI servers that you can have uh, Redshift to talk to. And this is typically the case where you have uh, lots of different users trying to access the reporting platform, and you'll typically have a server to serve these reports. Um, and um, um, different um, um, BI uh, tools have different um, functions and uh, uh, features available for you. So Tableau has what, what is called as Tableau Extracts that load the data periodically from the cluster so that if you have thousands of users accessing um, the uh, reporting platform, you go through an extract instead of directly um, accessing the data warehouse and cluster. MicroStrategy has similar concepts as well. And um, we have uh, integration um, in the console directly so that you can see how your queries are performing. You can look at slow performing queries. You can look at when a particular query is being performed. What is the resource utilization like? Was you know, CPU usage spiking? And is that correlated with a particular query running? Um, is uh, the network throughput spiking because of a particular query? So you can do those sorts of analysis directly using uh, the management console. We also have, uh, of course, you know, given it's a SQL um, database engine with the cost-based optimizer, um, you can look at the um, execution plan. You can look at the query plans as well. So query plan is generated you know, before the execution happens. And you have a way to look at the execution plan as well. The execution plan is going to be a little different than you're probably used to in the non-MPP world. Um, so in, in the execution plan, you can look at the average uh, time it took for a particular step to execute across the different compute nodes. So if you see that one particular node is um, having an outsized impact on execution, or it took a longer time on average to run a particular step, it's possible that you might have a skew in distribution, right? So we talked a bit about even distribution, key-based distribution, et cetera. So if you are distributing, uh, if your data is skewed and you have a lot of it stored on one node versus the other, it's possible that um, the query execution on that particular node could take a longer time. Um, so the execution ca plan can help you identify um, those sorts of issues and uh, uh, figure out options to remedy that. Um, so that's largely it. We have a few resources. We have a few related sessions here that might be of interest. We have a quick site session this afternoon, um, an Amazon machine learning session, and a database migration service session. Um, so if you are planning to migrate from a different database engine into Redshift, worth uh, going to the database migration session. That's it, folks. Any questions, I'm happy to take. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. So the reason for that is we don't want to provide direct access into the database files. So you can load the data um, you know, from S3 or whichever source, and it goes directly into the compute nodes, and it happens through the um, uh, internal VPC. The reason why those VPCs are separate is because for security reasons, we don't want to provide direct access to the underlying database files. So you don't directly have access, which means nobody else ever has access to come and directly talk to the compute nodes. 
So that is the reason why um, the VPCs are separate. You have all the access to the uh, data through the leader node, right? If you execute a query, if you're loading data, all of that happens seamlessly. You don't have to do anything additional. It's just a security measure um, to keep uh, um, the data secure. You have a question. Hello? Is there any benefit to using Redshift for, for a data set like on the, the order like 50 to 100 gigabytes of data, or is that just totally overkill? 50 to 100 gigabytes? Yeah. Yeah, so we have, so our smallest uh, cluster is a single node DC1 large, and that starts at 160 gigs of compressed data. And a lot of customers use a single node cluster. That said, um, I would recommend using at least two nodes, which would take you to you know, 300 plus gigs. The reason for that is single node clusters have durability risk. So if the cluster, you know, for whatever reason, if the hardware fails, you'll have to restore from your backup and which might be somewhat stale, right? Because we do incremental continuous backups, but they happen at a periodicity. So if you're having at least two nodes, then it, what it means is the, you know, the other node acts as a mirror to your first node, so you can tolerate at least one node failure and you know, get, go on with your work. So it's certainly reasonable. We have lots of customers using it at you know, hundreds of gigabytes range. Yeah, sure. Does Redshift support JSON B? Support what? JSON? JSON B. So or it's Postgre? Uh, sorry, I didn't. Is, is it a data format that you're asking? Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, we do. Okay. We do support it, um, but not necessarily in the way that uh, Postgres does. So you can load JSON data um, into Redshift through the copy command. And you need to have a JSON paths file which maps your elements right to the underlying data model. So if you have some elements that don't have a mapping to a data model, then they get skipped. And so, so that's the um, aspect which might be a little different. We also have native JSON functions. So if you load the data without flattening it through the uh, paths file, you can load that directly into Redshift. And there are functions that you can execute to query the JSON elements. But you're going to have a little bit of a performance impact because we are parsing data on the fly to execute the queries versus you know, having it in a flattened model. Support what, S3? Yeah, so we don't support nested uh, documents right now, uh, but we do have plans to do that in the future. Hello? The question I have is, you didn't mention data pipeline. Yes. So is that not the recommended way to load? No, it, it is a recommended way to load as well. It's one of the other options. Um, the reason why I'm, I was focusing a little bit more on the partner front is lots of customers have questions around, hey, like, would my data integration solution work with Redshift? But data pipeline is certainly um, an option to uh, orchestrate jobs and move data um, across AWS services and from on-premises environments as well. OK. Thank you. Any other questions? So you had shown on your slide how you can view the performance. Do you have anything for troubleshooting, like profile in the database, where you can capture the traffic, the query, the parameters being passed in? Yeah. So we have um, a set of system tables. Um, so some of the data in the system tables is reflected in the console, and we are in the process of adding more functionality to the console. But the system tables have a lot more information around telemetry and some of the aspects that you talked about. Um, so we have a Git GitHub repository with a set of scripts that access the system tables for various use cases and uh, present it. I should have added it in here, but I'll add it before posting it to the to slide share. Any other questions? OK. Thanks, guys.